about one more minute and I think we should be ready to go. Oh, there we go. Some of us just left uh, another workshop, but, uh, and then of course my link wouldn't work. So um, there might be a few more people joining us. Katie, can you hear now? Okay, you might be your, I don't think your headset's plugged in or something. We can't hear you over the mic. Not hearing you. No. We're almost set. And as the sheriff indicated, uh, there was a seminar this afternoon that was scheduled to end at five o'clock, right? Yeah, uh, scheduled to end at five. Yeah, so there may be, I'm sure, uh, Sarah Benedict is probably there and probably some others. We're almost ready though. Katie's climbing under her desk. And Petting the dog. <laughs> and somebody's got a noise going on in the background that sounds like my heart did before I had my ablation. Who's that? Can you hear me now? Yes. We can hear you. Perfect. All right. Um, I call this meeting of the Dunn County uh, Judiciary and Law Committee, a standing committee of the county board, called to order at whatever time it is. Um, the roll call, I can see on my screen that the five members of the committee and the county board chair are here, and I will introduce those folks for our millions of loyal viewers out there who may not be able to identify everyone. We have uh, Mike Rogers. I'm going to list these the way they appear on my screen. You might have a different order. Mike Rogers, Supervisor. Uh, Bob Bauer, Supervisor. Carl Vandermeulen, Supervisor. Uh, myself, Jim Tripp, I'm the chair, and Jim Zahn's supervisor, and uh, County Board Chair Dave Bartlett are here. Uh, we also have a number of other folks present at the meeting, and I'll ask when it's their turn to uh, give their reports that they identify themselves with their uh, name and department number. Um, Approval of the May minutes. If you've had a chance to look at those, I would entertain a motion to approve. I move approval. I secondary oh. that uh, approval, Jim Zahns. Vandermillen and Zahns move and second. Are there any uh, comments, questions, suggested changes, corrections to the minutes of the May 18th meeting? Uh, seeing none, hearing none. All those in favor of the motion to approve the minutes say aye. Um, aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Um, staff reports. Um, one of the reasons that we're having this meeting at all is that I think uh, with what's going on in the world, it's more important than ever for us to hear from uh, the departments that represent uh, law and the judiciary in Dunn County. And uh, I'm hopeful that next month we can actually have a live meeting. We'll see how that goes. Um, but I think, as I said, more than ever right now, I think it's important for the committee members to be well informed of what's happening in the county in terms of law enforcement and the judiciary and to hear from the folks most directly involved in those departments. So having said all that, I'm going to, I don't see uh, Sarah Benedict yet, and I'm guessing she's still at the uh, seminar. So I'm going to postpone her report. Uh, can we go right to 911 emergency management? Uh, Melissa Gellenbach? Hi. Um, Hi. 
I'll start off with the 911 portion. Um, we have been a little bit busier now that the uh, lockdown safer at home um, order has ended. So I think that we're kind of picking up speed where we uh, left off last winter as far as our call volume and stuff like that. We are um, still short staffed at this point. We have two vacant positions. We had um, planned on holding off just with the COVID situation and our training situation. We train very close within a couple feet. The trainee has to sit um, when they're up to the council with the with the dispatcher, so um, we've kind of held off, although uh, it's time that we move forward. Like I said, we're starting to get busier. Um, you know, my employees weren't taking vacations and things like that, and they want to now, and it's uh, getting a little bit harder to fill those shifts, so I do have to look seriously at trying to fill those and trying to find a way that we could uh, do training um, maybe with some better social distancing or um, possibly masks. So we're looking at that right now. Um, the only other thing for the 911 center is um, the Menominee Tower that Dunn County owns. We have a generator up at that site, and this spring when they did the maintenance work on it and um, checked everything over, they did notice that there was a couple error or a couple issues with the generator. It is, um, I'm not even sure how old it is. We actually took it out of the old jail back in 2003, 2004. Uh, we took it out of the old jail and um, reused it, repurposed it for the generator up at the tower site. And they found that um, there was a couple issues with it. We did have to have them fixed. One was the governor that would help it run, and it was very important that we get it fixed. Um, so that was a little bit of a sh uh, sticker shock. That was over $4,000 to get those couple items fixed. Um, overall, I did not have a line item that would cover that, but overall the budget should be able to handle it because of being short-staffed and different things like that. So um, at this time, I don't see that it's really going to affect the bottom line of my budget. But um, And that's it for 9 and one if anybody has any questions on that. Don't see any. Okay. Um, the emergency management portion, um, we did have reports of a tornado that did touch down, would have been about six miles northeast of Wheeler um, last week. Thankfully, it uh, touched down very briefly. It was um, in a field. There was no damage. Um, no one was injured or anything like that, but they did report it on the news um, a couple different times and so we had to work through that to make sure that we didn't have any damages or anything like that so um, luckily it kind of bounced down bounced back up and headed out of our county so we were very lucky on that um, other than that we're busy with COVID and helping a lot of different entities in Dunn County um, help maintain their PPE level. Uh, when we started out with COVID, we were focusing on the first responders, your police, fire, and EMS. And now the state has had us kind of branch out and we've been helping dentist office, um, the school districts as they talk about returning to school this fall. Um, helping them get the things that they need to keep themselves safe and the children safe when they go back to school. Um, we're working with some of the nonprofits in Dunn County, um, Stepping Stones and some of the different food shelters in the villages and things like that to make sure that they have the appropriate PPE to continue to have their services um, in operation, but then also some masks and different things that they can hand out to the public um, for those who are unable to procure their own. Um, I know we all see some masks and different hand sanitizers and things in the, in the stores, but um, we have been able to help some of those facilities 
so that they can hand some of those out for some families who are unable to purchase them. Um, so that ha that takes up a lot of our time working with COVID and the different aspects of that. But another thing that has been on our plate for a while and has been postponed due to some um, some COVID issues, but then also some health issues with um, Chris Strait, who some of you may know. Every five years, we are we apply for a grant um, to go through a process and work on our mitigation plan for Dunn County. And it's an all hazards mitigation. It can be the national disaster, like I just talked about, tornadoes touching down. It can be the flash flood, which we dealt with, um, you know, about a month ago. Um, it can be some man-made situations it's all in what the county focuses on or what we would like to focus on. Um, so it's a, called our all hazard mitigation plan. We do it every five years. Last year, well, we applied for it a couple years ago and last year we were awarded the grant to go ahead and go through the process. And um, Chris Street does that process for us. And that process, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is he meets with all of the townships the villages, um, law enforcement agencies, police, fire, uh, EMS. And he also meets with this committee here several times. This was kind of the steering committee for the plan. And he has the draft done, which I think most of you um, have seen Jim's email about it. But it's in the review, I guess, status right now. And we've been working on that. We'd like to get that um, finished up this year before the end of the year so we can um, take a look at that plan, see where we have some vulnerabilities in Dunn County, see where there possibly could be some funding for some mitigation programs. I know just recently in the last couple of weeks, we added a home um, to the list to put into the plan, they live um, kind of by some natural springs, I guess. And with the water table being so high the last couple of years and the flooding that we recently had in the last month, um, their home is flooded several times this year already. Uh, and so those are types of programs and different things that we can try and help people with if we have this hazard, hazard mitigation plan. If we do not have a plan, we would not be eligible for different funding programs that are out there for different things, storm shelters, um, maybe sirens in populated areas, this program that I just talked about with this gentleman's home, different things like that. So we have to have this plan in place to go out and look for some of those different fundings to help us. Um, basically mitigate things in Dunn County that we, you know, we hope to um, kind of prevent flooding and different things like that. So just so you know, that's all I think that's out there now, and that's kind of what it's about. And like I said, we hope to finish it up and get it to county board here in the next couple, three months. Uh, Melissa, refresh my memory. Do we have an end-of-the-year deadline on that? I believe it's actually maybe June of next year. Oh, okay. Yeah, I knew the, but I, we'd, yeah, I knew it was like nothing it, immediate, but. No, I think we'd like to get it um, finished up this year just because it makes it easier for fiscal payments going back and forth between us and the state. So if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Well, I, I think it's all but finished, and there is a copy mm -hmm. on the uh, Judiciary and Law Committee web page, uh, and I know Chris has it out for public comments. So uh, that's, mm -hmm. aside from our final sign-off and then recommendation of the board, that's, that's about the final steps, aren't they? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Melissa? Um, nope, I think that's it. Any questions for Melissa regarding either 911 or uh, uh, emergency planning, emergency management? Don't see any. Thank you, Melissa. Um, yep. Sheriff, you're up next. 
All right. Um, 2020 budget's looking okay right now. Um, jails, after Bill Pay last week, jail's sitting at about uh, 48, 49% uh, available in our budget. Uh, I think if I did the math correctly today, we're looking at about 43% left of the year. So we're right on track there. Uh, law enforcement budget, we're sitting at about 45%. So we're still above um, you know, where we would expect to be. Um, so we're right on track there. 2021 budget's been submitted. Um, a slight increase on both sides, jail and patrol, uh, or law enforcement side. Sorry, I turned my office light back on here. Um, <laughs> I'm you gotta move to, once in a while. <laughs> yeah, I sit in one place too long. Um, what was I? Oh, 2021 budget, I think we're um, the jail of what we submitted was approximately 4% increase, but that's all um, either, uh, you know, wages and salaries and uh, contracted increases for our medical and food uh, contracted increases. Um, nothing significant that, that we've added to the budget. Um, the uh, law enforcement uh, side is about the same, a little bit less, I think about a 3% increase with um, uh, body cameras and, and uh, Supervisor Tripp asked me to touch on those a little bit. We've actually been looking at body cameras for several years. Um, it, it comes, it, it sounds as simple as maybe buying a body camera and, and recording what you do every day, but there, it comes with a, a cost of um, retaining all that video for a certain period of days, a minimum of 120 days. Uh, felony case, it's significantly longer. We're looking at uh, retaining all that video we capture for for years and years. Um, so it's not just the cost of the video cameras, it, it's the cost of uh, uh, being able to store all that, that video. We've had squad cameras for at least 25 years. Um, I had one of the first squad cameras. Um, I think I might've had one when I went to patrol when I was 24 years old, about you know, 25, 26 years ago. Uh, they've changed a lot. It's all digital now. Uh, we're, we're running digital ally cameras and we have a wireless download software. Then when a, a deputy pulls in uh, either to our office, to a highway shop up uh, 25 and 64 or um, uh, Rock Falls uh, highway shop, that's automatically their videos, whatever they've captured automatically download to our server. So uh, now we add 25 body cameras to that and um, that's significantly much more uh, space we need to, to retain all that stuff. So you'll see that in the 2021 budget, uh, probably to the tune of uh, 20 to $25,000 to um, implement those, but society is, is basically calling for demanding body camera footage now. Um, and I, we've been ahead of the curve for years on squad cameras. Um, it saved us a lot of litigation. Um, uh, for the county, lawsuits that probably would have come if uh, it wasn't recorded exactly what happened. Uh, an officer's word against a, a defendant's word. Um, Ms. Nodoff can testify to the fact that they, they, there's a lot of cases that don't go to trial because of what we capture on video uh, when the defense gets a copy of, of the, the OWI stop, for example. Uh, they don't bother, you know, trying to even try that case. So. We obviously know the benefits to them, um, and, and we certainly aren't trying to hide anything by not having body cameras, but it, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's much more in depth than just buying a $500 body camera and strap it on to you. The, the resources needed to download all that information and store that uh, um, go along with that. So, um, yeah, as I touched on a little bit, every squad that we have on the street, um, from patrol sergeants to patrol deputies, uh, all have cameras um, and download wirelessly. We're looking at, uh, I think I touched on this on my written report, we're looking at some UV sanitation lights uh, for our jail facility um, and uh, to try and sterilize the facility. Uh, it kills everything from COVID to um, critters. Honestly, from what I'm told is these UV lights uh, are like a high intensity, um, you know, suntan station that that uh, 
kills pretty much everything with a DNA or NA. Um, they um, uh, reduce, um, the hospitals use them for sterilization of their surgical rooms and things like that. Um, so that's, and those would be repaid uh, by either CARES Act or re, um, um, the other grants out there available to, uh, to recover some COVID money. So hopefully in, in the long run, they aren't going to cost the county anything, um, but they're anywhere from $10,000 to $40,000. And we've kind of already eliminated the $40,000 option just because everybody else is making one that does the same thing for half or quarter of the price. So um, jail population staying about the same. We're still, we've kind of backed off from our, our volunteers coming in that we had opened up to initially. Um, with the spike in COVID cases, um, just to reduce any risk of COVID coming into the jail. Uh, we, had, we had started to allow some programs to reopen and some volunteers to come back into the jail facility, but uh, um, you know we're at 92 COVID cases in Dunn County as of I think this morning. And uh, that's probably gone up by five the way the weekend count went, but um, just to reduce any any uh, exposure to inmates and in our staff, we've cut back on uh, any volunteers coming in again. Um, still sitting at 14 state inmates uh, that are going to be moved out uh, in transition shortly uh, with additional, hopefully we go back up to the 15 that were originally contracted with. I've reached out to the state to increase our state contract. Um, to uh, go up to 20 uh, state inmates and uh, try and uh, uh, gain a little more revenue. Right now, they're not allowing or not increasing contracts, um, but uh, we're due for a contract renew in October. So hopefully at that time, we'll be able to increase our state uh, inmate contract from 15 to 20, which would uh, add a significant uh, revenue uh, back to the county, uh, probably another fifty to sixty thousand dollars a year. If we added uh, added them, so uh, I think that's all I had on my list. Um, Brenda, I think I see you on anything you want to add from the jail standpoint. You touched on a lot of the um, points that I was going to make. I just wanted to add that we did have our jail inspection mid-June and it went very well. Uh, the jail inspector, um, again, likes our compliance, um, loves our programs, uh, thinks our staff is very professional, cordial. Um, our jail is clean. He did have a couple of slight recommendations, but other than that, I mean, it went just fine. What kind of recommendations, Brenda? <clears throat> Well, the carpeting in the housing units is 20 years old. He asked me what I thought of it, and I I feel it's very unsanitary. Um, it, it just doesn't come clean when you shampoo anymore, and <clears throat> I think it would be better if we tore out all the carpet and just had concrete floor um, that you could mop. So carpeting... That's, yeah, just tear it out. It's kind of like yeah. having carpeting in your bathroom. It's uh, it usually doesn't last long. But. Right, right, yeah. That's pretty good to hear. Is that the main complaint was carpeting? Right, <laughs> right. Anybody have uh, questions for the sheriff or for Brenda the uh, about the jail? Um, one of the Oh, uh, Dave Bartlett. Uh, the carpeting, that could be used by that jail assessment fund, couldn't it? Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah, could, jail assessment funds could be used for replacing that flooring, and that's something we're certainly going to look at. All right. Carl has a question. I was wondering, with uh, bringing in state prisoners, how do you make sure you aren't bringing COVID in with it? Well, that's why they've been on lockdown for uh, four months now. Uh, state inmates um, have, they've, they've all been tested and um, they certainly, they're medically screened before they would come to us. 
uh, before they'd be allowed out of their facility. Brenda, do you have a comment about that as well? The sheriff is correct on that. Okay. And, uh, I saw your light on. Since I can't see you, I have to guess. <laughs> Anybody else? Questions for the sheriff or uh, Brenda uh, regarding the department jail? Um, I just wanted to mention that I, I had a little bit of an email exchange with the sheriff and uh, I think anybody that's alive today understands that our society is going through some pretty difficult times and very often the police and the sheriff's departments find themselves kind of in the center of this and I could not be happier than to say that's not the case in Dunn County. Uh, we've got uh, our sheriff's department and frankly, the Menominee Police Department as well, I think, have reputations for being top-notch organizations. Uh, I think it goes a lot towards, uh, it says a lot about the leadership uh, of those departments. I, I think it says a lot about the kinds of training. Uh, I think it says a lot about the hiring process. And one of the things that I'd like to do going forward is just to make sure that this committee is well aware of how, I don't wanna say successful, but, but how, how our sheriff's department functions and um, because there are almost inevitably going to be questions and challenges and I'd like us to be able to answer them. So appreciate the sheriff being willing and able to do that. Appreciate the sheriff's department's efforts. Appreciate the efforts in the jail. Uh, I think it says a lot about Dunn County that our jail has a reputation the way it does. So thanks to uh, all of those folks. Anybody else, anything for the sheriff? If not, uh, I see Sarah Benedict has joined us. Sarah, you were theoretically first on the list. Uh, would you like to go now or do you wanna catch your breath a little bit first? I can certainly go now, um, if you don't mind. That's just fine, go ahead. Okay, well, I apologize for being late. I was with some of you on a, a previous four hour meeting. Uh, we had our sequential intercept virtual workshop this afternoon. So we had some technical advisors uh, through the um, Policy Research Associates join us virtually uh, to help us walk through uh, the cross section of our behavioral health system and our criminal justice system. So this was um, a grant that we wrote last year for the technical assistance. It was supposed to be an in-person day and a half uh, workshop. They condensed it to a uh, two virtual sessions. So we had the first one today, really looking for uh, what resources we have in place, trying to identify gaps, and then um, I talk about priorities and some rankings. So um, this, uh, our technical advisors really gathered all the input and tried to get a, a picture of our system. Um, they're gonna put together a report. They're gonna bring it back to us to, um, to look at and have um, voting on as far as what we wanna identify as the, the priority areas. Um, and then they're gonna give us an action plan at the end of it. So uh, we'll have a second virtual session sometime in August. It, it's not scheduled yet, um, but I have to tell you from the comments that I heard, um, they were really impressed with what we have going here in Dunn County um, and just the collaboration that we have across the board. Um, of course, there's areas that we want to improve uh, and, and, and we'll work towards that, but I think um, bottom line was that they were just really impressed with all of the things that we've been working on throughout the years. So um, I appreciate everyone's time uh, today who participated. So that was pretty big. Um, so some other notable updates, um, grant reports were submitted for second quarter. We're already halfway through the year. Um, so we've got our reentry grant and our uh, treatment alternative grant. So uh, we sent in the paperwork for the reimbursement there. Um, we have been, um, some of the work groups of the CJCC have kind of started back up. Uh, Katie Shally leads our data work group. We've been meeting the last several months. Um, just started to get some of the other work groups uh, going, um, but we do have an executive meeting coming up on Wednesday where we're gonna talk about uh, work group expectations and really relook at our goals and uh, activities that we um, drafted up at the beginning of the year. We had some grand plans for the year. Uh, 
uh, and then COVID kind of taken over some of our um, efforts. So we're just trying to adjust to this new normal situation um, and kind of regroup and uh, figure out where our priorities are. Um, there will be a CJCC meeting on the 13th of August. So that'll be at four o'clock. So once um, the, the agenda is worked out, I'll be sure that you all have an invitation. Um, that will be a virtual meeting. So a um, little bit easier for folks to attend uh, perhaps. Um, there was a WCA meeting, uh, Judiciary and Law Committee, um, a few weeks ago. So I participated in that. Uh, the committee looked at um, some of the resolutions that will go into WCA's um, platform for their September meeting. So um, there was really just kind of reinforcing some of the same um, areas of emphasis as far as uh, state funding for TAD, um, state funding for um, the, the 911 systems. Um, there was some debate on some training for sheriff's departments and uh, that, was, that was tabled because um, they really didn't think it was their place to talk about, you know, what training that the sheriff's department needed uh, without the sheriff's department's input. Um, so they're really just looking at across the board training on implicit bias, on uh, de-escalation techniques. So not just our law enforcement folks, but perhaps other criminal justice partners too. Um, so that WCA group meets twice a year. So the next meeting will be in October. Um, generally, it'll be in October. Um, and then I do want to share our, um, we have a new uh, re-entry venture uh, that we we're um, starting. Um, so some of you may have heard our veteran service uh, service officer has an intern um, who's been doing really well. And uh, with a partnership with our reentry program and Buffalo Pepin County, um, he uh, the Buffalo Pepin County UW Extension wrote a grant and they received it to support our veteran service officer intern uh, really developing um, some peer supports for our veteran population. So uh, really just taking a look at how they can uh, get some input with different focus groups, but then really put together um, some resources specific for veterans. And then they would like to um, kind of use us as an example of getting it going, but then take it to other parts of the state as well. So just another example of how we're trying to collaborate and, and do more with less and really try to connect with people before they're released from jail so they can keep those positive supports moving uh, while they're out in the community. Um, as far as the criminal justice division itself, um, business as usual, as far as the virtual business, um, court uh, sessions are virtual, most meetings are virtual, um, so staff have adjusted to that. Um, we have had some staff COVID scares with children in daycare, um, some quarantines, but thankfully uh, no positive tests, it was just exposure, but um, just kind of re-emphasizing why it's important for us to, you know, maintain these the social distancing and all the, the good practices that we're trying to um, put in place. So that's it, unless I have questions. Carl. Uh, part of the discussion recently uh, over police and law enforcement has been whether there are situations for which currently <clears throat> law enforcement is called, for which it might be better if some other uh, some other agency were contacted, somebody with a different sort of expertise, maybe somebody who isn't an armed and uniformed officer. Uh, any, has there been any discussion of that? Yes, actually, I think there was discussion uh, at our, our sequential intercept mapping that um, 211 system is underutilized and there's interest in the, um, you know, there's a co-responder model where law enforcement goes out with a therapist or behavioral health, um, but there's interest in having maybe the behavioral health or the substance use um, person to be the one kind of going out in front. So um, there, 
we've certainly started the conversations and we've been learning um, through some trainings of the different models that are out there. Um, but I think um, there's some real appetite for some change, especially with uh, Menominee Police and their Project Hope and trying to move forward with um, securing funding for um, to really have a behavioral health um, specialists work in the police department. So um, yes, there's definitely conversations. A lot of times, um, you know, there's a lack of therapists, um, there's a lack of funding. Um, it's a major kind of reshaping. Um, but I think there's certainly things that we can uh, work towards um, that being more of the go to versus having law enforcement be the main responder. Thanks. It's good to hear that. Carol, I think I could follow up with that and say, we'd be happy to give it up. <laughs> but, but the question comes in now, what if, what if this person who is suicidal and it's, and it's historically shown somebody that's suicidal is homicidal. Now we put somebody in danger of going to, going to a location with somebody who becomes violent. Um, and I think law enforcement's going to end up having to be involved one way or another. Um, but I love the idea of giving it up and responding to mental health calls. I just don't know if it's real practical. And, and if people have thought through the, the whole process of, of sending a social work out, worker out to deal with somebody who's in a, a mental health crisis that, that may become violent. So I think we, we may be putting somebody in harm's way that, you know, unintentionally. Thank you for the question, Carl. That was uh, entirely appropriate as for the answers. And I think it indicates how much work there is yet to be done in terms of uh, addressing, you know, I, I hate to say this, but virtually everything I look at these days is filtered through the county budget. Um, I should be looking at people and, and resources. And instead I look at how much is this gonna cost? And frankly, if we do it right, I think there are cost savings, um, not to mention the more appropriate dealing with human beings. And, I, and I, I'm really proud of the fact that Dunn County is somewhat of a leader in this area. I think our CJCC and our Sheriff's Department and the related programs. Uh, go a long way towards that, but it's a conversation that needs to continue. That's for sure. And I appreciate the question, Carl. Anybody else questions for Sarah on uh, criminal justice? Seeing none, uh, Marcy, that brings us to your portion of the program. Good evening. So our um, office has been busy as usual. Um, we're at just under 900 deaths um, so far this year with combined counties. So we're up from last year. At this point, of course, that can change. We could end up with a slow month, which would be appreciated. Our um, budget overall looks um, good right now. Um, we're watching the forensics line item, um, which we don't have control over. One thing I wouldn't want to do is determine authorizing autopsies based on what we have left in the budget. Um, one of the things that changed with autopsies too is Sacred Heart Hospital due to COVID has closed their doors for autopsies. And we do at least half of our autopsies with Sacred Heart because they're more of a medical autopsy than a forensic autopsy. And we're having to take all of our bodies to Ramsey County now at this time. Um, for the autopsies, and that is an increased cost in transportation as well. Um, but otherwise, the, oh, the budget overall looks good. There's line items we probably won't use um, for the for, um, seminars, the conferences and seminars. Those aren't um, being held now at this time. Um, there's talk that our main conference that's usually in June that I was scheduled to be a speaker at might take place in November, but I doubt that'll happen. That's just conversation. Um, we are still down one staff and that's a Dunn County um, deputy medical examiner. Um, kind of like Melissa talked, it's a one-on-one -on -one training um, job. So I've held off. Um, that's in part why we're down one. The other reason is it's super hard to find somebody that's qualified that's going to fit in and do the job and to put the work in trying to train them and have them leave right away 
sometimes um, is less beneficial than having a body there. There's no labor pool to draw from. And we've talked about that complication with this particular department in the past. Um, as far as COVID effects on our department, um, early on the preparations of mass casualties um, was very time consuming and worrisome. And thankfully we have not had to deal with that at all. We're still at um, zero deaths in Dunn County and um, three in Eau Claire County. So the other way that COVID has affected my um, department is a Twice now, uh, one of my deputies um, has had to be out for quarantine for a couple of weeks, which means we have to cover her or he or she's shifts. And um, that really kind of falls on Lynn and I to cover those shifts because um, all of our deputies are limited to their 1,559 hours a year and already scheduled and all have a full-time job. So there's quite a bit of um, hours being put on Lynn and I over above our, our usual expectation, um, as well as I had a deputy out for three months from hip surgery and rehabilitation for that, and we covered those hours as well. Um, COVID has affected our number of suicides. There's three um, confirmed suicides that were as a result of how COVID uh, either scares, uh, none were COVID positive. So just what the effects of um, COVID and quarantine and financial effects were on them. They do not get listed as a COVID death, but it is um, a separate tracking that it, it was partly um, from mental health issues to start with and then the effects of COVID. So other than that, I don't really have much more to offer you. Any questions? Any questions for the medical examiner? No, nope. don't see any. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you. Uh, courts, I don't see any judges on the phone. Katie, that means that you take the whole load. Okay, thank you. Um, we've developed our operational plan for COVID-19, so hearings are to be held by phone or by Zoom. We're starting to reintegrate more public into the courtrooms if need be for contested hearings, or if an attorney or someone wishes to be in person, the judges are allowing that as well for court. Um, individuals are required to wear a mask upon entering the building, and then they must keep their mask on the whole time during court. That's been straining on individuals, including the attorneys and judges as well. It makes for some very long days wearing the mask. We had our very first jury trial on July 8th. It was a three-day jury trial for six people. And we ended up having one alternate juror. It went really well. I ended up having to hire Prevea Healthcare to come screen all of the jurors and test them before they entered the building. But so far it went well. The jurors were really happy with all the protective measures that we put in place for them entering the building and taking care of them. What we're running into is our court calendars are very backloaded. Um, a lot of hearings have been rescheduled due to people not communicating with their clients or defendants not reaching out to their attorneys. So we're feeling stressed, I think, that way as to how are we ever going to dig ourselves out of this hole. Um, it's going to take years, essentially, is what our district court administrator is saying at this point in time. So we just need to adapt, adapt to this new normal of going slow and steady and hoping to get progress in the courtrooms. But I know that that's frustrating for everybody involved in the court system as well, because they want to see progress or be in court. And unfortunately, we don't have dates in the very near future to provide them. We're doing a bunch of cleaning after people leave the courtroom. So I think that everybody's feeling pretty safe when they enter. We've had plexiglass installed around the witness stand. So we're allowing witnesses when they enter the courtroom to be masked, to remove their mask when they testify, and then they could place their mask back on afterwards. And that seems to be going pretty well in the courtroom. As far as court staff, we're all reporting into work. I'm trying to decide if we need to come up with a plan B for when the school time hits. I do have half of my staff that have children, so I'm worried about what might happen uh, come the fall if they're going back to school or if anybody does get COVID. So I'm working on some planning for that process because we we all know that the could we have fear that it might hit us one day and then we're going to have to cancel court for 
hundreds of court cases for a week or who knows how long it might last for. I have one uh, full-time deputy clerk position. She had left and went to another department. So I'm in the recruitment process right now. Uh, as far as our budget goes, we're actually doing really well. I expected our numbers to be lower on revenue, but we just got our state aid reimbursement and our numbers looked really well. We got some nice reimbursement numbers from them. Uh, we've been collecting a decent amount of money from our Department of Revenue, even though people aren't working as much. I think our numbers are pretty steady. So I, the only line item I'm worried about is our mental examinations. We've had an increase in mental Chapter 51 cases been filed this year, which seems appropriate given the scenario we're all dealing with right now with mental health. But we've also had a couple criminal cases need some pretty expensive uh, doctor evaluations. So that's taken a big hit out of the budget. Um, but otherwise, I think I think we're going to be on track to doing okay so far. I've spent a little over five thousand dollars just on cleaning and masks and the plexiglass and getting different protocols and mailing things out to the individuals involved in the court system. So we've spent some money on that, but I've been tracking all of our costs and submitting them into the county for some of the um, re relief funds available to us as well. Are there any questions? Carl. Uh, from what I understand, ventilation is more important than cleaning. Uh, has has uh, ventilation in your offices and uh, courtrooms been checked out to make sure there's plenty of air exchange? Um, I did work with our facilities department. They do believe there's proper airflow and ventilation that gets recirculated through the building. We've not purchased anything to put on the air exchangers by any means. Um, so at this time, I think we're comfortable with the way it is, but maybe we need to look into that a little bit more as well. At the time we met, they felt like it was sufficient. Chairman Bartlett, you're probably as familiar as anybody here with the, uh, the remodeling of, of this building. Um, what would you say about uh, the government center in terms of air exchange? It's a little off topic, but... <laughs> Well, I, I think the air exchange was, you know, improved a lot when we remodeled it totally. Um, but I've, I've wondered that too. I've read some articles about special filters that, that uh, will clean germs, I, I guess. I think they're, they're a, a charcoal filter like you put in a car. Uh, they can be quite, quite a bit more money than a regular filter. But I was, I was just thinking when, when that was brought up, I should ask Scott that and talk with facilities. I thought about it when I read that article, and then I kind of dropped it. I uh, kind of forgot about it. But I, I, I have to follow through on that. Thank you. I, I've got some little bit of background uh, with air filtration and movement, and I'm skeptical of filters, but uh, I think th Carl was onto a good point, and that is uh, a good ventilation system, uh, I think is um, probably more significant than the filters you put on. But there's there's a lot, lot to that, and I'm not claiming to be an expert. Like I say, I've got just a little bit of experience. Uh, anything else for Katie in terms of the courts? Any other questions? Don't see any. Thank you, Katie. Um, brings us to uh, child support. Jeannie Stevenson. Jeannie, you're. Okay, now I'm unmuted, correct? Okay, all right. Um, okay, so my budget looks good. I'm like all the other departments, our conference money is obviously not going to be spent. Um, we continue to hold court. Uh, the majority of the court hearings are being held telephonically. But that still means we're spending money on service of process. Um, so that budget line, I'm a bit concerned about, but I think it'll end up being okay in the end. Um, so I think all in all, uh, we look good. Our uh, revenues, I think, are in place um, and looking good. We had 
an increased amount of money, I believe, that came in um, with the um, COVID stimulus money that was paid out to people. Um, we actually had some money that was paid on fees. So that's uh, revenue um, on our end. And so that line item is looking good as well. I still continue to have three remote workers. The three specialists are still out um, working. I did bring my fiscal clerk back. Um, however, she is going to be going on vacation. She will be flying for that vacation. I'm recommending that she quarantine when she gets back um, for two weeks after she gets back. So she will pack up her stuff and go back home for a two week period of time. Um, the three remote workers I have really like working remote. So um, I anticipate that they'll be coming back, at, but I'm not certain of when that will happen. So um, we will take a look at that again later on. Um, we have started genetic testing again. We hadn't done genetic testing from March when we closed. Um, I did my first ones again in July. We're following the protocol of the testing facility that we, that we contract with. Um, I did work with Scott at facilities and they built us a plexiglass divider for the conference room table. Um, the customer themselves are swabbing themselves and they're swabbing any children that we're testing. And so um, it's for us, it's making sure that we are following the necessary protocol in terms of um, everything we're sharing, the swabs that are being shared by handing it to the person and getting it to them. Um, most of our customers have been receptive to the um, increased um, requirements for the testing. So that is up and running again. None of my staff have expressed any concern about doing it. And so um, hopefully that um, will continue. Um, you may or may not know, but I, yes, I am retiring. August 3rd is my last date. Um, a replacement has been named. Josie LaLiberty has been an employee in the Eau Claire County Child Support Agency for quite a few years. Um, she will officially start August 17th. Um, she will be here working with me three days this week. So she'll be here Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. During that time, we are going to go through a monitoring, uh, a mini monitoring um, by our regional office. Typically we go through the triennial um, audit, which the state has backed away from this year. I was scheduled to be one of those um, counties and they've pulled back on that now, but she wants to do a mini um, monitoring um, with me prior to leaving. And as long as Josie is going to be here, it worked out really well um, that she can participate in that monitoring and go through the monitoring tool as well. And so um, my guess is that you may get some requests for her from her um, for some changes. As I've told you um, for quite some time, I am betting that she is going to want to fill one of the positions that I have not filled. Um, she may very well consider filling it. I don't know. I can't speak for her part-time, full-time to pick up the slack on some of the things that I have been doing that um, somebody new coming into it um, as a manager, I don't know that they're gonna be able to continue that, but just an FYI. So um, you may hear from her that way. Otherwise, um, it's been a really nice ride. I appreciate everything you're, you know, the supervisors have done. You've been extremely supportive of my department forever. Um, and I appreciate all of that. Um, never did I believe I would stay here this long, um, much less in child support this long. There aren't a lot of us crazy people that do it for quite as long as I've done it. But um, hopefully at the end of the day, I've helped a few people along the way and um, it's, been, it's been very interesting. So um, I appreciate everything. I'm extremely grateful for the, for the opportunities it's given. So I appreciate it. And that's all I've got. You will be greatly missed. Well, I appreciate that, Dave, very much. And uh, 
I, I wished this was under different circumstances so we could have a, a great big going away party. Well, I appreciate that. I just, you know, I got to the point where it's like, I don't know if I would be feeling the same way were it not for COVID-19. I don't know. It certainly added a different layer to management. But I think truth of the matter is, is that, you know, I, wanted, I want to leave before I have people saying, gosh, I wish she would just get out of here. So I'm, <laughs> I'm excited. I have no idea what retirement looks like outside of, I don't know what it looks like not to work for the county. So um, it'll be interesting. I'll let you know how it looks. <laughs> well, we were, we were far from uh, saying you should leave. So you wouldn't well, have had to, but but no. it's a little earlier than I thought you would, but I, I expected towards the end of the year. So, yes. yep. so uh, the best of luck to you. And I, Thank you. I hope you stop around or, or. When the uh, buildings open uh, up, remember I still have to yeah, pay property taxes. So yeah, right. I'll be around. <laughs> it'd be, it, we will miss you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to echo the sentiments of Chairman Bartlett. Uh, really want to thank you for your service and congratulate you on your retirement and offer you best wishes. If you want to know what retirement looks like, it looks like still sitting over your coffee at about 8.30. <laughs> you know, those, those retired people that say they're busier than ever, that's a big lie. They're not busy at all. Uh, we're Working people have already uh, made their breakfast and done a load of laundry and driven into work and having half an hour of work done by 7.30. Retired people are still reading the paper at a quarter to nine. <laughs> Carl, well, did we'll you have a comment? We'll make that transition. <laughs> yeah, well, I, you, you might have to work at it for a day. <laughs> I think so. I think I will. <laughs> Thank my, you. Comment, my comment is along the same line. I've been on the committee for several years, very much enjoyed working with you, Jeannie, and uh, you. admired uh, your dedication to the job. And uh, it, it really helps me appreciate, uh, you know, people who work in government and uh, serve their communities. You're a fine example of that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Like I say, I hope I've helped a few along the way. I've had a couple today that weren't real happy with me, but, you know, such is life. So <laughs> thank you. Well, you know what they say about counting the day lost if you don't catch all for something. Um, <laughs> I better quit this. Uh, Andrea, District Attorney's Office, what have you got for us? Well, first of all, Jeannie will certainly miss having you as a neighbor, and I can't imagine coming to work and not having you here. So good luck in your retirement if I don't see you. Um, Thank you. As far as my office, we uh, had a vacancy in our victim witness. Uh, it's the grant funded position, ended up filling that. That person will start in a couple of weeks. Um, so that will be good. As far as um, the effects on COVID, I have my office back. Everyone's coming in person. I'm very happy about that. I understand remote working can happen. It, I don't like it, just put it that way. I mean, I, I understand it needs to be done, but I feel like um, someone else in the office is picking up those people's slack. And so I'm um, very happy to have my staff back. I feel like we're much more productive. Um, I can have face-to-face -face conversations whether than, rather than sitting down and typing up an email and I can just quick ask something to get done. So I'm uh, very happy about that. I hope that, um, you know, if COVID gets a lot worse, I may have to reevaluate that. But for right now, this is what we're doing. Um, as far as court, it's been frustrating to say the least. Um, I can't tell you how many times we've had a preliminary hearing, which is a pretty basic hearing where an officer comes in and establishes probable cause that a felony was committed. So the court will make arrangements. The defendant wants to appear by Zoom or phone. We have our officer here, we're ready to do testimony. Sometimes the officer even testifies and then the defendant says, no, I wanna be there with my attorney. Or, you know, we'll say, we'll stipulate to identification of the defendant and well, they won't stipulate, they wanna be here in person. So then we set it out another month or two and our officer has to come back in. So um, it's just a little example of 
kind of what we're dealing with. Um, the defense attorneys as of late have been coming in. I think that into the building instead of working remotely, that has helped in the last couple of weeks as, as I've seen. Um, but I also see in the last couple of weeks like crime seems that we got more people in jail again. <laughs> so um, it seems as if we're getting pretty, pretty busy. Uh, certainly have a lot of child sexual assault cases. It's just a, been a, it seems like case after case on those. And so um, my office is generally charging all of those out and I anticipate those will go to trial. Those are difficult cases where it's hard evidence that he said, she said, or she said, she said, or whatnot. But um, so I anticipate we will be very busy. We do have the uh, trial calendars out quite a bit already. So um, some good news are uh, first degree intentional homicide, Richard Seahaver, he ended up pleading to um, a second degree intentional homicide. Not that I couldn't have proven that, but um, I felt pretty confident that given his age and criminal history, he'd get a substantial sentence and he was sentenced to 40 years in prison. He's in his 50s, um, so it turned out to be, I think, in my opinion, a really good uh, result. Ended up saving the county a lot of dollars. Uh, homicide cases are not cheap, especially given the some issues in this case. So, um, and the family uh, was able to come in. They flew from California, given the courtroom was closed. You know, I had a meeting with the judge and we were able to still allow the victims to come and um, make their statements to the court. So everyone seemed fairly pleased with that outcome as much as you can be given the circumstances. Um, as far as my budget, it uh, is looking pretty good. I've got 50% left for the DA side and um, I've got like 45% left on victim witness. Um, submitted some reimbursement claims for COVID and I heard um, from human resources that they anticipate that any costs associated with unemployment compensation that are due solely to COVID should be 100% refunded to the county from the state. So um, that will really help my budget um, overall given right now we're still in good shape given those uh, workers compensation costs. Um, my office supplies is only, I only have 7% left. I always go way over budget on that. Um, my other line items usually buffer that, but when I heard uh, Sheriff Big talking about body cameras, um, uh, <laughs> my, my worries just got increased quite a bit um, because that's gonna add a lot of cost for me for discs as well as time of burning discs as well as time reviewing discs. Um, I feel like a broken record but I, I can't begin to describe over the last 10 years how technology has changed prosecuting cases. I mean our last homicide case had you know 150 discs and the amount of time to actually review all of those is um, certainly a, a big concern for me. It's where now we've got squad cameras, we'll have body cameras, we'll have um, victim statements, and then we've got all kinds of apps and text messages. And there's just so much information now to prosecute a criminal case. Um, so I, I understand the call for it. I understand the need for it. Um, it's just gonna add a lot of, a lot more time and um, certainly some costs to my office to prosecute cases, you know, should we move forward. Um, in a dream world, it would be really nice if the county, if it's going to invest in a different type of IT. I, I certainly believe the sheriff's department as well as the PD is in need of a, a huge storage system. And I know it's possible to have it so it could just be, you know, transferred to my office and then my office could transfer it to the defense council. So we're not reviewing these and spending how many dollars and how much time copying disks. Um, but my understanding is that is a very expensive project. Um, in the event we move to body cameras, I think we're gonna have to continue to look at this given 
how much money we're going to be spending on discs. And my understanding is they need to be Blu-ray discs, given all of the data that's on them. And I think we're talking about 15 bucks, 10, 15 bucks a disc. Um, so it's just something to think about um, and certainly understand our times. Um, my other homicide case, Gary Steyer, I believe will be resolved at this time. Um, I think part of the struggle for Marcy's law has been the courts not, and I apologize if I'm speaking for the judges, but this is my interpretation. Um, our courts are really backed up and now Marcy's law gives victims even more opportunity to have input, to have their time in court. I certainly believe they deserve that as well, um, but it's causing a struggle trying to find the time to give them that opportunity to have that right. So um, it's just sort of another thing where we were going to move forward on a, on a case and we had to adjourn it, make sure that we had more time. And given we only have two judges right now, I think um, it's certainly difficult finding the time to make sure everything's done right. Um, we are making sure it's getting done right. It's just um, pushing cases farther and farther back, which makes it just more difficult on victims and more difficult um, from my office's perspective to prove cases as people's memories dwindle over time and details become fuzzier. Um, and I think that's it. Any questions? Any questions for uh, Andrea for the district attorney's office? I don't want to question, if you don't mind. mind. Supervisor sure. Bauer, you're looking at more manpower then? Are you looking like you're not going to do this all yourself? You're looking for other people to help you out on this, I, am, I assume. Potentially, um, I guess we'll just have to wait and see what this entails. Um, you know, the Sheriff's Office in St. Croix County has staff that transcribes all of their recordings. And to be honest, if it were me, that's the way it should be done because what it takes hours to review them. And then when we go to a court setting, um, defense attorneys have the time and money to have these transcribed. My office relies on attorneys and legal secretaries to review them. Um, you know, I try to pick and choose those really important cases to send them out to get transcribed, but that takes quite a bit of time. Um, so I mean, ideally, if we could get some technology, there's it exists to transcribe videos, to transcribe interviews, and if we had um, the data to transfer files as opposed to burning disks, giving them to my office to burn more disks, to send them out to review. And part of the problem too is some of these disks are so big that then I need to transfer them to my desktop because I won't even open, and that takes hours to to burn as well. Thank you. Anybody else? Questions for Andrea? Don't see any more. Um, thank you to all the department heads for your reports. Um, item number five, items from the chair, there are none. Six action items, none. Seven reports, resolutions for the county board, none. Announcements. Does anybody have announcements? Um, I just want to mention that, and I think I've communicated with everyone regarding written reports, um, in an effort to kind of reduce the amount of tedium that goes into this, uh, I'm again going to remind you that you're free to submit a written report at any time that you feel that it would help us, the committee members, to understand the issues. And in some cases, uh, that would help to elaborate. But uh, otherwise, uh, we're going to try to do without them as much as possible. For the committee members, if that's a burden, if that does not meet your needs, be sure to let me know. Um, because we can go back to written reports at any time. But, but again, if we can streamline the process a little bit, I'm all in favor of that. Um, anybody else have any announcements? Seeing none, uh, we are scheduled for our next meeting on August 24th, 4.30. Uh, I'm gonna see if we can do this live. Uh, there are a couple of things uh, for one thing, 
Um, department budgets will be presented next month, if I'm correct about that. Is everybody ready to do that? Uh, and there uh, are maybe a couple other items that would better off be um, work at a live meeting rather than on, uh, on Zoom. But again, we'll see what things look like a month from now and we'll see what we can do. Anything else for the good of the order? Seeing nothing. Uh, one more time, Jeannie, congratulations on your retirement. Best wishes. Thanks from all of us for everything you've done for the department, for this committee, for Dunn County, for the kids in Dunn County. And with that, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, folks. Go home and eat your supper. Night, all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Good night.